This episode of The Honeydew is brought to you by Skillshare and Raycon. More on that later. Let's get into the do. The Honeydew with Ryan Sickler. Welcome back to The Honeydew, y'all. We're over here doing it in the Night Pan Studios. I'm Ryan Sickler. You can follow me on social media at Ryan Sickler, ryansickler.com. Uh, please subscribe to the YouTube. I see how many of you are watching. Uh, the community has grown. Like like I said, I don't know when these episodes will air, but within a year, we've built it to like 100,000. And I don't know what other people are out there doing. That might not be shit. I really don't know, but I fucking think it's pretty good. So thank you for your support. I love to see the community going. The guests, the stories are just fantastic. Uh, and the Patreon, if you want another episode a week, Go subscribe to the Patreon. It's five bucks a month. If you sign up for a year, you get a month free. Uh, and again, I don't know when this is going to air because we're recording ahead because Ash is moving to Austin like everybody else. Uh, beginning May 1st, you're going to get the Honeydew for free, excuse me, ad free a day early. All right. Ad free a day early at no additional. I guess it is free. I'm not charging until maybe 2022. We'll see about that. Uh, but anyway, subscribe. And if you or someone you know has that story that's got to be heard, please submit it to honeydewpodcast at gmail.com. Um, and I, again, I know that's a lot of money for some people right now, especially after what we're all going through. And uh, if you have it, hey, I'd love to have you. Um, and you do not need to be a Patreon member to submit your story. All right. Uh, you guys know I record here at the Santa Monica Music Center. We're working with Outreach Through the Arts right now, teaching the kids how to podcast. Uh, they got a great show we're still working on here now. And uh, very excited to bring that to you, as I am very excited to bring this guest to you today. All right, you guys know what we do here. We highlight the low lights. These are the stories behind the storytellers. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the Honeydew for the first time, Chris Duffin, y'all. Welcome to the Honeydew, my man. <laughs> Thank you, man. I'm I'm really looking forward to some conversation today. I, lo I love that you're here. I appreciate you reaching out. Um, before we begin anything, please plug, promote everything you have. Do it up. Everything. This oh, is Chris Duffin okay. time. Whatever you want. You know, I, I I'm not big at plugging things. If you follow the stories and you wanna you wanna check stuff out, it's pretty easy. Just go to my my personal website, Chris Duffin. That's like muffin but with a D. All right. <laughs> really simple. Or ChristopherDuffin.com. Yeah, if you, you're listening to this on some device, you type that thing in the the little Google window or whatever. Uh, my name will pop up. If you get on social media, you type in Chris Duffin. You don't need to remember any avatar or whatever the things are. I'll pop up. I got the little blue check thing there there next to me. So follow along. I do stuff around, um, well, improving mostly in the physical realm, but we're going to talk mental stuff today because I do a lot on that. Yeah. Um, but uh, everything that I do is I sell the best biomechanically sound barbells and products in the world uh, at Kabuki Strength. That's K-A-B-U-I. K K A B U K I strength.com coaching and education. We work with 90% of professional sports teams in North America. Is that right? Uh, we're working with, we work with uh, the Ravens. Uh, I don't know all the teams, right? I, I'm, I'm terrible. Uh, Orioles, Baltimore they, Orioles. Yeah. Do you? Yep. You should just say yeah, even if you don't make me feel so. Good. <laughs> uh, uh, well, Major League Baseball, <laughs> they need some motherfucking help. We, we work with <laughs> help them out. Please. There's 30 teams. We work with 29 of them, for Absolutely. example. So when I say when I say 90, yeah, percent I mean yeah. like it's you know any major college you listen to, uh, big uh, Marvel Studios actors for the current movie, all the actors for Black Adam, and you know Dwayne Johnson uses our stuff. Uh, yeah, I mean, you're the starting line for the Lakers. Fuck, Every, everyone. So, and I love the, the shirt. The best of the best. So, I love the whiskey and, and then, deadlifts. Uh, we could talk about that. Yeah. Uh, and barefoot athletics. Uh, so, best and minimalist shoe uh, as far as improving foot mechanics around. That's barely B E A R. And you'll understand why the reference to bears for barefoot once we get into these stories. Uh, I want to check those out. And then, yeah, if you lift weights and use supplements, build fast formula. That's what I. That's my mind as well. So I'm kind of all over the place. Yeah, everything that I do and believe in, I bring to life. All right, I love that, dude. I love that, and and I love what you said too. We're here to talk about mental health today with you specifically because you emailed your list. I ask people to put their trauma in a list, and it just hits different when you list your trauma. If you've never done it before, where you write it out and you're like, oh my god, oh my god, I've been through some shit, you know. But you have. 
quite a story. So let me ask you. A, uh, there is ahead. a best-selling book. Yeah, I was going to uh, say. So you best-selling got a book. autobiography, The Eagle and the Dragon. I actually read the audio version, too. So it's unavailable on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Audible, all that sort of stuff. Link through my website as well. And if you you can get a free audio download through my through my website. So oh, that's great. That's really cool. All right. I, so you, uh, where are you originally from? That's a tough one to pin down. All over the wilderness of Northern California and Eastern Oregon. Okay, so you're a wilderness uh, family. Wilderness, wilderness. Yes, yes. Like you said, you start. You mentioned something at six. So just take me there. Like, do you have brothers and sisters? I got three sisters and a brother. And you guys were all out in the wilderness. Yes. With both parents. Yes. <laughs> Tell me about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, just uh, six years old. Mm-hmm. We're there's a meadow, a little stream running through it in the mountains. No roads into this. And next to that little stream, that's our campsite. We've got beams lashed up into the trees. And, and when you say campsite, what are you living in? Tent? No, the beams lashed into the trees. There are beddings up there because there's rattlesnakes. Like tree fort we're talking yes, about? Yes, tree forts. Wait, you lived in a tree? Yes, I lived in a tree fort. Usually it was tents uh, or you know a condemned home or something of that nature. But at this time, it was tree forts. This is Northern California. It's up in the Trinity Wilderness, uh, just off of uh, Humboldt County. Mm-hmm. I've been up there. Yeah. In, in the 80s, pretty wild territory. People running around with machine guns and things like that out there because uh, the weed growing. Yeah, I've seen heavy. Murder Mountain. Yeah. yeah. So that's where we lived because that's what my parents did. <laughs> uh, in a manner of trying to make money. Okay. Uh, so but they grew. also... Yes, gotcha. but uh, it was bigger, just more of not wanting to be part of society. So six years old, I'm sitting there, and I've got a live rattlesnake in my hand, <laughs> right? And it's <laughs> a hell of a sentence. <laughs> it's I'm holding its head, you know, you, pinched right what behind the jaws, you know, between how my, big? My uh, it was wrapped all the way down around my forearm, which is like. It's silky smooth. Like, it's just this coldness, you know. I've had, yeah, I've arm. had one on my neck. And Not then, a rattlesnake, but a black snake. Fuck and, that. And Wait, you're, it, it, you're six and you're squeezing and it you're where squeezing the mouth it. is Yes, because you have thing. to keep the mouth uh, yeah. open and controlled. And it's sitting there. In order to do what? What is the point of this? To overcome fear for most part, right? I mean, Fuck that. I'm not fucking kidding you. <laughs> Who's teaching you this lesson? This is your dad or your mom? My, my stepfather. Oh, your stepfather. Yeah. Okay, okay. Well, it, it sounds like some stepfather. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just sitting one, there. so I it, can say it's it. sitting there. It's got you know those snake eyes, like yeah. a real thing, Fuck you know, yeah. staring you in the eye, and it's sitting it's there. It's also hissing. a rattlesnake. It's sitting there hissing it, and you know, like. Is that if, fucking th- 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 going on your no, arm? No, not uh, not when it's like that. So that's when they're coiled in the bush, okay. ready to strike. And so, but that's what I'm learning how to manage, because if I'm out walking around and doing this stuff by my, you know, walking around <laughs> the home, right, which is the wilderness, and there's rattlesnake dens <laughs> there's around. Snake in the kitchen. <laughs> it's right over here, in the, right by the redwood, right okay, there in the okay. kitchen. <laughs> oh, oh, okay, we're gonna. Right. My mom's pregnant at the time with my Jesus with my second Christ. sister. And there's a time that a rattlesnake was sitting there poised and ready to strike behind her in a bush while we're sitting Come there. Come on. I'm not joking you. And my stepfather's having to, like, warn her, but, like, make sure he's not scared, you know, like, striking the snake at the, you know, or at the same time. <laughs> I got anxiety hearing that. I, can't, uh, I don't like okay, snakes. I, I got a good. Uh, so, anyway, it, it's. Yeah, tell I me had about to this. learn how to. To be able to manage those because they're going to be around, and so you. So you went that you picked it up. No, what okay. you do is you have a you always walk with a stick, okay, with a Y in the end. So it's cut, and by Y I mean like about the length of your finger, V'd at the end. And so what you do is you have to once they're they're coiled, um, you got to understand that they can strike about two times as far as what they look I've, like. I've learned that. Yeah. yeah. So you tease it; it'll sh- it'll come out and strike, and then you catch that right over the head, right behind the head, right. <laughs> So what you, are you talking you, you, about? And, and then, Wait, then you're, while you're holding it down. The, then you're holding it down. You reach down. You grab it, right? And then, but if that have, Y's got to be lo- yes. small enough too to yeah. pin, pin it against exactly. the ground. Yeah, man. There's a lot of mistakes <laughs> you can make here. A lot and of mistakes. You pick, and then you can grab it safely, right? And then you have to know where to cut the head off too, because we're going to eat it. Right. And we're going to yeah. skin it because we're going to sell the. We don't have any money. Mm-hmm. So 
they were attempting to grow weed and doing other stuff, but we we had no money. Like we had nothing. <laughs> Otherwise, we probably have a home to live in, and they would drive to the <laughs> yes. right, oh. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so so you're gonna sell the the skin, sell the skin, and you're gonna eat, eat the, meat, the snake. Yeah, but, I've had rattlesnake, but it's, you gotta cut it. Bad. You know, right behind. You gotta know where the uh, venom sacs are, which okay. are in the neck behind the head. And but it's it was a lesson learned of how to how to actually be safe. But at the same time, you know, mentally learning. By doing the most dangerous shit yeah. you can. For the most part. Yeah. Well, it's the environment I lived in. Now, here's a, here's, here's a funny story about my mom being pregnant, okay? My mom is a tough cookie. I've learned <laughs> well, so much from her. Say, only white people would do this shit. Black people, <laughs> if there's ghosts or snakes, they're fucking like, we're moving, man. We are not fucking moving. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, they're so, like, nah, nah, nah. So my, my mom goes in, though she's going into labor. And so she has to hike out to the dirt road and wait for somebody to drive along. The first person to come along for some reason was a dump truck. Wait, she has to hitchhike? Because this is what year? 1982. And how many kids there? already are there? Uh, one, three. So dad's now back with the three kids at home. And mom has to walk. No, I'm, I'm, I'm probably, I'm probably watching. So that's I grew up watching, uh, taking care of the family. But you're six. Yeah. But I hear you. Yep. But you're six. Well, well, yeah. you're over there handling rattlesnakes. <laughs> so you know what? You're already fourteen. I had no childhood. I don't. Yeah. <laughs> you so. jumped a lot of years that so, day. Bro. Yeah. So mom walks to the road to thumb it to get taken in town to a hospital. Yes. And how far is that? And that's so long ago. I don't remember. But and it's, you're letting your wife get into the first fucking car that could be a lunatic. Yeah, yeah. But a dump but truck rolls by. Jump bike truck rolls and by. And he picks her up. He picks her up, except... Do you guys see this? No. This is her. Far. It's probably like at least a mile, that, you know, uh, away. <laughs> this <Right>? is... So... <laughs> I can't even right so, now. So, so uh, apparently... I don't know why. There was two people in a the truck. They... There wasn't room for her, so she has to climb in the bed of the dump truck. Get the fuck and, out of here! And they drive to the, they drive to they drive to town, which is probably you know forty five minutes an hour down into like society, <laughs> and they drive up to the hospital. And my mom climbs out of the bed of the dump truck, goes in the hospital, and delivers. I'd my have sister. been like, dump me, just pull it, dump me. I'll slide so, out of the back. <laughs> so, so that, they delivered your mom to the hospital in a dump truck. So yes, she in the back of a dump that. truck. Yes. <laughs> So, That's insane. Dude. Your mom is a soldier, bro. Oh, Your you have no, you have no soldier. idea. Well, when we get into the nasty stories later, you'll realize just how much Whew. of a tough cookie she is. Okay. So, uh, and you know, when I tell the stories about my upbringing, my people are like, "Oh, your your family must be you, you know not that bright, or you know mountain folk, or white trash, or all this sort of stuff." And we looked the part. I mean, we go into town and clothes are dirty, you know, high water pants, knees sticking through, you know. Not as a fashion statement. Um, I like went to Ash, school like, like, like Ash over there with uh, with the uh, yeah. with the torn out jeans. He pays uh, for those holes. Uh, <laughs> no, no, no. We we were the original when it wasn't cool to have. I'm getting torn those out when jeans, he's right? done with them. Yeah, and uh, and yeah, people people. Ju this is a question I want to ask you about your mom and your dad's relationship for a minute. Are they on the same page or are they fighting? Like I feel like if you're gonna make a wilderness family work. You better be on the same fucking page. My mom was in control. So she always had men that were going to do what she wanted. And I don't know how she did that, but she's... I think we know how she probably did that. I think she did that. Okay. I think we know how she probably did that. She was going to school to be a chemical engineer, had a scholarship, was top of her classes. She was a, you know... Before big, she had her first kid? Yeah, before oh, me, okay. I was the first. Oh, you're first. Yeah, okay. uh, and actually, she was still going to school with me. And then she she had some. We're not going to get into her life, but she had some really rough trauma in her childhood. Some really bad shit happened, and she, authority, not her deal. Uh, and she basically decided that she did not want to live as part of society, and so she still lives in kind of the environment does that we're talking really? about. Yeah. Oh wow. Okay. So. What does she live in though, for real? She's Cabin got, or uh, she's got a mobile home, mobile home uh, okay. in a town of about a hundred people in a county. I think there's eight hundred people total in the county. No shit. Out in the desert, and she is a miner. She's got uh, she does uh, rocks and things like that, and doesn't doesn't like being around people. Yeah. Uh, and lives. She's lived her life one hundred percent on her terms, 
And so this was the early of trying to figure out how to make a living, um, you know, and being, you know, not a living, but just, you know, the lifestyle, the being outside of what we're used to. And uh, she did that. And in essence, when we get to it, I've kind of end up doing the same thing, but within society. But <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, so, you're not so, that person. <laughs> so uh, um, I forgot where I was going You're with back to uh, your rattlesnakes, your mom's dump truck. She has a baby. She comes back. Oh, yeah. So I was just saying. This is it's child like, number it was four, a, it was correct? A, it was a choice. Yeah. Yes, it's a choice. It was your a choice. parents, I was asking if they're on the same page, but you're like. Your mom's running the show. My, my mom's running the show. Yeah. He was along for the ride. And uh, yeah, so that, that's. Except that's, on that dump truck. Your mom, <laughs> rolled, your mom rolled solo on yeah, that, bro. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> but. So uh, what happens then? Where do you. How long are you there before? And are you being. I mean, I don't even want to use the term homeschool. You don't even really have a fucking home. Are you being tree fort schooled? Like, how no, are you no, being I, educated? I, I, went, I went to school. Okay. So, so they did say. Usually. School. Summertime, we were 100% in the mountains. Got it. And then that's where I said it may be a condemned home. It may be a home without running water or electricity or something like that. Or sometimes it was um, through the winter or through the school year, we would go uh, closer to town and I would be a, enrolled in school and my kid sisters uh, were enrolled in school later, you know. And so that's where, you know, kind of rough upbringing for me, just like I did not relate to people very well. I wanted to ask it, you, like, did it ever, because this is, this is what's crazy about trauma and, and our lives. Like the weirdness and all that shit when you're, it's normal to you. It's, it's what normal. you know. You, you don't, don't know a fucking no. thing, but what it, happens when you get to school? Do you have, do you spend the night at friends' homes? Uh, do they ever ask to come to yours? Like, what is that sort of like? Definitely didn't have friends at my place. And actually, I've got a really, really sad story uh, about that that was really early on that kind of shut a lot of that down for me. Um, this was in a very remote town in uh, in called Hyam Palm out in Northern California, again, out on the Trinity. Like, you get to an hour, you get to a town of 5,000 people, and then another hour, you get to this little town that's got, you know, a run one-room schoolhouse and a little general store. And I had a friend, and this was uh, first grade. And I started staying the night at his house because it was nice. That's what there I'm saying. Like That's got to be fantastic. It was amazing. Yeah. So I ended up staying the night every night at his house for like a week, right? And I asked my parents like, hey, I, I want to spend the night at his house again. They're like, no, you, you, you can't because you're, you know, imposing on them. You're, we don't, you know, my parents never wanted to ask for charity or ask for help sure. or do like, we didn't, they were very, we're, we're on our own, very proud. And we got in a fight. Like I threw a tantrum. It was when your fight was not really a, a, a the correct term when you're in first grade, right? And I remember that. I was throwing a tantrum. I went home. I was, you know, cried in my room. I was all upset. And that next morning, I found out um, the house burnt down, and the entire family no. died in it. No, yeah. I didn't. What I didn't speak for a year. Are you for real? Yeah. From like what age six to seven somewhere in yeah. there, you didn't speak for a year. Yeah. What? Oh man, you got so many stories. All right, let's talk about so, that for a moment. How do you come out of that? It's tough. I don't really. You don't even speak I don't with really, your family. I don't really parents. remember. So, at, well, here's the thing, though. At the end of the year, we're up in the mountains again, and there's there's been a couple interactions with some police officers. So they come out. They're based way far away, and. There's this uh, this police officer, and he – people are known for, like, kind of disappearing around the guy, right? And and they would be out in these remote communities, and, yeah, the people, like, the stories running, like, hey, what happened to so-and-so? And so he shows up at our – at our where we were staying, this uh, – uh, used, there used to be a mill, and there were some homes for people that worked the mill, and they were really torn down, and that's where we lived, okay. right? It was this little string of uh, – I don't know what you call, but run down shacks. And and he comes up to uh, to the door and knocks on the door and mom's open it and there's a pile of weed on the table. And he's like, I'm I'm arresting you, taking you in. And she knows the stories. And she says, Chris, you you gotta run and find Pat, my my stepfather. And so so I and I take off and I find him, you know, partying, you know, 
you know, down the road a half mile away or so ago. And I'm like, hey, you need to come back. And mom says, bring people. So they come back and they watch and everybody's just there. one cop? Just, there's two cops. Two, okay. And they just observe because <clears throat> that's all she wanted to know was make sure people knew that she was being taken into custody. And so for some reason, they got pissed about that. So they ended up not even just taking her to the jail in that county. They went to the county over. It was even further away because they knew it would be hard for right. us to get get to her because vehicles and things like that is a challenge. You got to find somebody to get a car so you can go go there. And it's hours away, you know, through. Oh, it's through hours. The, yeah. Shit. We're talking. We're out in the, the Trinity Alps. It's like the this w- mountain range. Like everywhere you go is these big windy roads. Like it's remote. Mm-hmm. And that plays really important into this story. So that was during the school year. And then that summer, we're up in the mountains and we're camped out. I'm, I'm, you know, it was like in the morning. Uh, Is so she still in jail at this time? No, she's, she's out. out so now. she, okay. it, it, you know, took a few days, right. got her out and we're up there. So it's mom and Pat are still around, you know, it's in the morning and we see we're set up our camp set up. So we can see the big white, the road coming up the mountain from way miles in advance, and we see a bunch of police cars coming up. And mom's like, "Chris, you got to watch the kids." She takes off. Pat takes off, right? So she's out uh, killing her local grow site, which is just their lo- their actual, su- you know, their supply. And I don't know what Pat's doing because the, the commercial grow sites are long ways away. And uh, police show up and they take uh, all of his kids into custody. So I just want to understand. There's Four children just sitting there when the cops show up, you being the Five oldest. Five at this point. Five. Yep. And you being the oldest. And it's just like, where are your parents? You're like, man, it's just us right here hanging out. Yeah, yeah. Where did and, you – I got to ask. Where did you guys go to the bathroom? What Just outside? What you, Is that all you did? Yeah. I mean, you, you, shit dig, you dig a stuff hole. outside? Yeah, you, you dig, dig a hole. hole. You bear it, you know. Where did you shower? Uh, so the, the best way to shower is you take gallon jugs to the stream. And you fill them up, right? And then you go out and you find a sunny spot on a rock and you set them out there. And I, I did this all the way up through high school. You set them out on a rock during to the warm sun. up. And they warm up. And at the end of the day, you Nuh-uh. dump them over your head. I, no. I love you, dude. No, that, that's it. <laughs> through and high then, school, you and then, did that. And, 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 this well, is what then, I'm saying. I hear then, shit like this. I'm like, what High school where we were in <laughs> Oregon and it was, it was, uh, we we we're, we and we'd, Definitely didn't camp. I mean, we'd live in trailers through the winter. We had a 16-foot trailer. Fam- family that size in a 16-foot trailer, uh, which I don't know. That's the size of this room. Right? Yeah, it's not. Like, this there's, is 10 you, There's nowhere 10. to room. Add, This add is your spot, and feet. you sit there, yeah. and that's it. And then you roll it out, and then you sleep. That You don't even move. So I would be wandering around. But anyway, um, uh, you would heat the water on the wood stove and step out the back door in the snow and dump it over your head to bathe. <sighs> like, that's... This is my. Uh, yeah. This is the way I live. That's amazing. I'm sorry. Hey, hey, I, I, I I I took you down off on a tangent. There. But so this the story, show up the police show up. This is a really there. critical they, they story. T- your mom's cutting the, the yep. personal stash. We don't know where the fuck Pat is, and they take the. Five they take kids. my sisters, my brother. They're all just. What are they? In the what's back the youngest? The car. Uh, she's nine months. Months. Nine you got months. an infant. Yeah. Okay. And so I might get emotional in this part of the story, just the way it goes. I'm getting emotional. And uh, so, yeah, it was a little weird experience. I still reflect on it today because we're in the car and my sisters are all bawling in the back. And I'm just sitting in the front with no emotion whatsoever. And I'm like inwardly going, what's wrong with me? Why am I? Why am I? You know, and I'm just a kid. Like I'm second grade. Uh, Yeah, I think I was second grade at the time. And I'm like, why am I not? responding to this situation. I'm sitting here asking the police officer about his, is my inner dialogue about his uh, radio stuff and other things in the car. Cause it was fascinating to me because I hadn't seen anything like that, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And, but we end up getting taken and putting in foster care. My mom gets, they, they catch my mom, they throw her in jail. Oh shit. And my mom is in jail for, you know, a few months. I don't remember what the charges exactly were. And she has a dream. And she's like, there's something funny about this cop who's now the sheriff, what people disappear around him. And the way the child protective services and like, you know, the things that she's seen, are like something's clicking. She's like, this is, this is not good. And she contacted the DA 
and told them the story. And he is like, I believe you. And they investigated. So hold on. You're th- so this now sheriff has a past history of people disappearing around him. Yeah. And you said you mentioned the Child Protective Services. The, they're somehow involved yeah, remember with this him is, or he's. Well, that's where they take us. And then they move, right. and then this happens with other people because they. This happen, you know, they're helping these. So they, they the, take these, these they, marijuana they're, they're, they're farmers. Taking these, they take their children. These people in the remote areas that nobody cares about because they're trash. Right. Right. Who's going to care to about these those bigger people? cities far away and put them in these areas? And, and are uh, all of you children, you, you and your siblings, are you guys all together in this one no. place? They've separated. They separated. How many? Uh, everyone in a different place? Or? My sisters were all together with the same person. Okay. Because it was a human trafficking ring. Ugh. The cops are they, in on this shit? Yes. How's your mom fucking put that together? I don't know, but this is real deal. This was in national news. Tell, I mean, please, tell me everything. They caught, they caught the, end of the man that had my sisters as he was boarding a plane to leave the country. He was trying to take him out. Sorry, I'm getting, I'm getting a little. No. They, 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 he was trying oh, to he escape once they, Got he it. was running, but they were prepping to sell him. To what? Tell me, to what? To who? Do you guys know where that? I don't know. So the sheriff went to prison. He did? And a, lo- a number of the police officers and uh, this person, his name was Jamie Bodison. I do remember that. My memory around these times are That's really tough. That's the guy I that don't... was running? That was the guy that had my sisters. Sisters, okay. Yeah. So your sisters were placed with this man? Yeah. Which already is fucked up. Well, it was a family, sure. right? Yeah, but, but yeah. He, is, and... They had done, I, go, just, we're just going to leave the story here and move on. Okay. But, um, yeah. Uh, but you, so were you and your brother were together then? My brother actually ended up, he had a different father, and uh, he ended up uh, being uh, taken by them. Okay. And that's a really, that's a really rough story too. <laughs> um, they will touch on it later. Sure. So uh, he's up in the mountains right now, just out of prison. I uh, think he's got a generator, got some water from a stream, Keeping it OG. and he's still there. He's still there. He's still doing it in the same area, still doing the same thing, just living. Um, he's got a lot of shit to deal with, and I'm trying to help him, but there's only so much you can do for someone. So <clears throat> so they do they par- then let your mom out of yeah, jail? Yes. Okay. Mom I mean, gets that- out of jail, uh, and... She's still, they're still working that, so she can't take us yet because they're like, well, you guys don't even have a home. You don't have, like, there's still issues, right? So my grandparents from Idaho drive down, rush down. I got pictures of us picking us up in the courthouse after all this, and they take us back there. And so we spend the summer with grandparents uh, before uh, parents make a home in Oregon. Your mom's parents? Uh, Yes. Okay. Um, Well, her mother. Um, And, uh, so they move up to Oregon, her and uh, Pat, my stepfather, my sister's uh, father, and set uh, set up a home. Hey, we're gonna we're gonna get out of the drug trade. Can't can't ever have this opportunity of losing the kids again. And so they were able to uh, get us back. And then uh, we spent about a year being quasi normal there before uh, you know, mom's just like this. We need to get back to being away from people. And so they moved into the mountains again. Uh, and picked up uh, kind of mining, logging, things like that, living in tents. And that's where the 16-foot trailer came in. Uh, and uh, There's seven of you in there. Well, not my brother, though. Okay, that's right. He went Yeah, okay. so it was down so to six. Six of you. Six of us in a 16-foot trailer. I mean, so I, I'd Jesus. Walk. So I, I just I walk mean, around just, the, I, I, you know, the. You'd have the, to leave to get any prize. I, I did, and, but it's cold. It's, it's Oregon in winter. Like, there's a. You know what? We're right off the road. There's a stream running by, but it's frozen over. So I'd like ice skate with my shoes up and down the stream into the mountains and back and go hiking. I'd hike all over the mountains by myself. And and that's uh, that's what I did. And then during the summer, I'd help with uh, either logging or mining. So a lot of a lot of time just work. Like uh, it's my whole life, like a very physical uh, type stuff. And then, so can I ask you, because we've talked about Pat, what you've said is your stepfather. Do, what do you... Did you have a relationship with your biological father? Did you ever? I did. Get, you did. I did. So, uh, my biological father was uh, uh, he. Oh gosh, um, 
he didn't have a job because he was a uh, major uh, bipolar depressive, runs in the family. So his mother shot her, shot her head off with a shotgun. Oh, uh, his brother jumped out of a building here in L.A. Oh, my God. Uh, there, it goes all the way back. So I don't have a family on that side. He, he attempted suicide, I think, about seven times. I watched one of them. What do you mean? Uh, he covered, poured himself with gasoline and stood there with a lighter threatening to kill himself. <laughs> Listen, so, I'm not laughing at I, that. I am just I, can't believe the shit you are telling me. Not that I'm no, I don't be, I no. think you're lying. I am just in disbelief. Like he, he stood was, in I, front of you and covered himself, yeah, poor gas, well, and then and then threatened to do it or yep. did try to do it. Yep. And then he ended up uh he, he told me to call someone, which was his uh AA uh person, and they came and got him. And I was I didn't Man, tell he my mom waited to the last I second to make I didn't, that. I call. didn't tell my mom because I knew I wouldn't be allowed to see him anymore. So I went and stayed with some of his friends for the rest of the, you know, the week or two weeks during the summer that I'd go see him with some family. I didn't know who it was, but I couldn't like let that happen. But yeah, he was a he was an interesting man. He was he spent like three years in Tibet up in the uh, monasteries. Man. Very spiritual. Got me into uh, meditation at an early age. We all see these spiritual you know people and and uh, I I learned a lot from him. But he just wasn't capable. That's why he was okay with my mom. You know, taking me. He knew he couldn't manage being a father and raising me. Okay. And um, also, my mom said that she'd freaking kill him i read it in a letter uh, uh yeah so your mom <laughs> I found a letter to him, uh when he after he passed i was reading through my stuff i'm like that's my fucking mom right there and she's she's hard as fuck she's like this is the way it is i love you i've always loved you don't fucking try to this is what she wrote him from prison or from jail when i wasn't so that's why i he didn't come and take me because she's like you're not taking my son you know what'll happen <laughs> And uh, so <clears throat> from prison, she had from, that power. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's power. So, uh, <laughs> is what you said your dad passed? He passed. Yeah. So uh, we had an interesting. Like, he d- dealt with alcohol his whole life. I mean, I remember I'd I just jump on a bus to go down and see him, and route, figure out my way to route. Like I'm freak. I can't believe I'd do this. Like you know, fourth, fifth grade. I would be like, hey, mom, I'm going to go see my dad for the summer. She's like, you talk to him, right? And I'm like, oh, yeah. You know what? And I'm going, I sent him a letter like a month ago saying I was going to come see him. She's like, okay. Uh, and I'd get a $14 a Greyhound bus ticket down to uh, San Francisco. And I'd figure out the bus route from San Damn, Francisco really? up to Santa Rosa and show up at his place. Like, and I'm like, what the fuck am I doing? Like, I reflect back. I'm like, but there was one time I showed up in San Francisco and I couldn't remember the route to get to his house. So I tried calling him. And... The phone kept buzzing. So I'm stuck in San Francisco Greyhound Station for like a day trying to talk to the operators because it's going, let, break the call with my dad. And they're like, we can't do that. And I'm like, hey, come on. I'm like a 12-year-old kid here in San Francisco. I'm freaking out. like, And so like, we'll break the line. Turns out he, he was drunk and melted the phone line together. Uh, nah, and uh, he melted it. Yeah, so it read <laughs> it, it read as busy, and uh, but they could get through, and so he like you know he's all worried, so he paid for a taxi from San Francisco to Santa Rosa for me, which was hundreds of dollars at the time. That was a lot of money back then. Hell yeah! There's another time I show up and I'm like, he's like, I got to walk down to uh, get you, and I, I can see him coming from a long ways away, and he's got piss lines upon piss lines on his sweater and his shirt because he'd been in bed for two weeks and hadn't got out. No way. And he'd just been pissing himself because that required getting up. And yeah, so it was it was an interesting relationship, but uh, he passed and it was it was a really crazy experience. Um, were you any chance you were there? Did you get to see him before he passed or was it sudden or what? It was, uh, I was sitting in New Oregon by this time I was working as a professional and it was Friday. It was Friday afternoon, uh, the last day before Christmas shut down for the manufacturing facility. And I'm in the gym, I'm in the gym locker room, just post-workout, sitting on the bench, getting ready to put my clothes on and figure out, you know, uh, hanging out with uh, friends and stuff like that over the next couple of weeks and what I was going to do. Phone rings on the bench and it's uh sheriff. He's like, Hey, this is the sheriff for uh, Mendocino County. Um, you know, uh, your father passed away. It's been a couple weeks uh, ago, but we've had trouble finding you and you're the only family member. We need you to come down here and take care of his family member left. Yes. Oh, 
And so anyway, I go down and I take care of everything, get him cremated. And uh, he's living in a housing complex uh, for people. And I just put all this stuff out in the middle so that people could take all his books. So he was... He, my whole family's avid readers. That's all we ever do, do is read. My mom, my stepfather, everything. We didn't have TV. We didn't have radio. Say, yeah, didn't the have library was, I mean, we would get, get stacks of books. We're yeah. so, like, that's, my family is, like, uh, we, we may have been a, we were a white trash mountain folk, but were we, well were, we were well versed. We were like that. Yeah, <laughs> that was what we did. Yeah. And, uh, Let's take a quick break and tell you about our first sponsor, Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community that offers membership with meaning, with so much to explore, real projects to create, and the support of fellow creatives. Skillshare empowers you to accomplish real growth. So I've told you before about Skillshare. I love doing their classes. Right now, I've been doing kids' kitchen cooking from scratch with kids under five. That's the class. I've uh, been working with Stella in the kitchen, trying to get her to stop being so picky on some foods, seeing what she likes. She gets to see the ingredients that go in things. Um, so I really like it. I really l enjoy learning. And the classes are easy. You got to check it out. There's anything you want to learn. Go on Skillshare. You'll learn it. All right. Practice makes progress. Advancing towards a goal is achievable with short lessons and hands-on projects. There's nothing better than getting better. Accomplishing growth is extremely satisfying. So do something today you couldn't do yesterday with classes designed for real life. Skillshare is also incredibly affordable, especially when compared to pricey in-person classes and workshops. I wanted to take a, an in-person before the pandemic uh, cooking class with Stella just for the same reason. Boom. I'm not doing that even when life goes back to normal. I'm staying with Skillshare. An annual subscription is less than 10 bucks a month. All right. Explore your creativity at Skillshare.com slash honeydew, and you'll get a free trial of premium membership. That's Skillshare.com slash honeydew. Our next sponsor is Raycon. Whether it's for work or play, a lot of us are going to be on the move again this summer. All right. I'm going traveling. I'm going to Baltimore. I plan on going visiting family. I plan on doing a lot of getting out there now, especially that I'm vaccinated. All right. Uh, and I wear my Raycons everywhere. I just was down in Mexico, took my Raycons. I'm out by the pool with my Raycons in Mexico. Listen to what I want to listen to. They're fantastic. People keep asking me, how do they stay in? They have adjustable earbuds. You put them right in. I'm telling you, Raycons are great. I use them. My stepson took them, won't even give them back. My other pair, I had to get another pair. So whether you're working out, a pair of Raycon wireless earbuds in your ears can make all the difference. You get crisp, powerful beats at half the price of other premium audio brands. Raycons look great. They feel even better. They come in a range of cool colors and with customizable gel tips included for a comfortable in-ear fit. And they have multiple sizes. They will fit your ears for sure. And Raycons are built to go wherever you go. They have quick and seamless Bluetooth pairing, 24-hour battery life, and a compact charging case. I'm telling you, I take them everywhere with me, on walks, to traveling. I give them to the kids in the car. So listen up. Raycon's offering 15% off all their products for my listeners. And here's what you got to do to get it. Go to buyraycon.com slash honeydew. There you'll get 15% off your entire Raycon order. And it's such a good deal. You want to grab a pair and a spare. That's 15% off at buyraycon.com slash honeydew. Buyraycon.com slash honeydew. Now let's get back to the do. So uh, a year later, I'm sitting in the same gym Friday before Christmas break. Uh, last day of work, the <laughs> finished up my workout, sitting on the bench, the cell phone rings. Pick it up. Hey, this is the sheriff for Deschutes County. Your stepfather's passed away. We know that you're not the biological son, but what we understand is you're the one in the family that takes care of things. You need to come over here and do that. And, uh, and it's the same, like, time, everything. Fucking day. I'm, How many years later? One year. Just one. One year. Not the same exact day of the month, right, but the, right. same the, the, time the, same, frame. the same, like, in my world, the same thing. It's Friday. Right before, like, all, I'm sitting in the same spot. Same That's bench, nuts. just finished my workout, fucking right there. 
And I'd get uh, the fuck out of that locker room. So, so uh, <laughs> that was the last time I, uh, yeah, the last time I did I, anything. Uh, I quit that job and decided I was going to take a year off actually right <laughs> I'd after be that. Scared but, to piss uh, in that bathroom. <laughs> but so I drive over. My sisters actually ended up. They stepped up and took care of everything, um, which is interesting, by the way. I, I raised my three sisters, uh, even we'll talk. So they they're like, brother, you've been taking care of us. We got this, and so they took uh, they took care of everything. But this is what struck home for me, and this has had a huge effect on my life. They left with nothing. The only people that they had, my stepfather had his daughters. They were the world to him. My father had me. It was the same. It was everything. It's the only thing he had. And... I've told some stories that may paint them in a bad light, but there's lots of positive things as well. And you, you got to look at those things. And, but the only thing that they left still was just mixed emotion, a mixed bag of like, wow, I don't know. There's so much positive and negative and all this. Um, I, no mark on the world other than that. And that mark was a mixed, a mixed, bag and uh that resonated with you it resonated with me why you didn't want to be like i didn't want to be like that i want to i knew i wanted to leave this world a better place and i wanted the people that i've been around and touched in my life to know i was fucking there that's all i'd say all the time all you have to do is be there that's it show genuine interest and just be there None of the other and shit matter. You guys, you're living in tree forts for Christ's sake. You're living in fucking tree forts. You got other kids with these palatial mansions and they're crying because they don't get to drive fucking, you know, six figure SUVs and yeah. bullshit. Like, come on, man. Yeah. All you really need oh, is I, to be. I, I get frustrated sometimes when people talk about, you know, being poor and it's like, look around. You've got the, the gaming center, you got your fancy phone, you got nice clothes. I'm like, you're not fucking poor. I'm sorry. Uh, you're not. I, you're not. Yeah, you're not. And I'm like, it may be a struggle. You may have some challenge and anxiety. I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, but also at the same time, be thankful for what you had because I was thankful for what I had when I grew up. And I can tell you all the lessons that I learned about it to make me a better person in this world today. So what I want to ask you is after hearing all these stories growing up in literally but, the world, go ahead, please. Let me tell you sure. just a, two more tidbits. So this is a funny story. Well, okay, it's a it's a dark story, but uh, <laughs> you mean it's compared, yeah, 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 yeah. compared to the yeah. light one so, you've shared? So, so uh, <laughs> it's uh, Thanksgiving. This is high school. We actually had so in high school, I finally had a stable, like a, a mobile home that we lived in, and it didn't have it had running water, it had electricity. Uh, the doors were curtains. Are you using kerosene heaters inside? We used uh, to use kerosene heaters all the time. In our um, no, it was uh, it was uh, electric heat. So uh, little the little baseboard heaters. Yeah. And they wouldn't keep up, so like you'd figure out the oven would be open. You'd fill the b- bathtub with hot water, so that the, the heat would you'd be pulling the heat from the water heater too. And but because uh, the windows were crank closed, but they wouldn't close, so you're covering them with plastic and things like that. And we had to f- do do a two by four framed kitchen to put a sink in, uh, so we'd have a counter and stuff because there was no there was no kitchen in the place. But it was fucking stable for four years. I was in high school, and and it worked great. But we just still struggled. So one Thanksgiving, it's getting tight. And uh, uh, like maybe it was like eight weeks before Thanksgiving, we'd end up getting these pet rabbits because they were free on the nickel ads. So Pat runs over, gets these pet rabbits, and we um, each of my sisters gets one. <laughs> <laughs> I got a feeling one of them ain't going to make And, <laughs> and uh, there might have been some foreboding because they were named breakfast, lunch, and no, dinner. Come right? on, man. <laughs> and so there are my sisters, like babies, for like six, eight weeks. And Thanksgiving rolls around, and Pat comes and he's like, Chris, we don't got a turkey this year. We can't afford one. Let's go out back. It's Thanksgiving morning. We go out there, twist the heads of the bunnies. All three? All of them. Is that how you do it? I don't even know how you kill a rat. You uh, twist it yeah, hold it between. Or is that it, just it, it is one, one of the ways. That's the way. Pat wasn't necessarily the best about some <laughs> things like this. So um, uh, 
I, I was you just talking to my mom the paper. other day, and she was like, "I was I talking, I was talking about this like little this lamb we or the sheep we found, and like he and my mom's like, yeah, I had to finish that, but he tried it with a baseball bat or something. Anyway, Jesus uh, Christ, say, porcupine killing's an interesting thing too, because we we ate all sorts of shit. So you ate porcupine? Oh yeah, we what ate is porcupine. That like? We That's ate all kinds be. of is mushrooms. You got to skin it right away, but it's a little tough. It's a red meat. Uh, but you got to get that hide off of it right away. But man, they got a thick, thick skull. It's uh, uh, <laughs> Joe Pesci's so, out there beating so the fuck out of That's how thing. you do it because you could shoot them with a 22 over and over again. And they still keep moving. For real, a 22 them out of the knock. tree. <laughs> And, that's all it, and you got to hit them. Off. And I'm like, people are going to hate this podcast. They're like, you're horrible. Oh, you're uh, highlighting killing animals. Like, no, do you understand? We had to do this. Food. We have to do this that to live. Food. Tell like, me. Yeah. Is that right? That, that was, was food. food. That was it food. Is. You're not you're Like, that's what it, freaking yeah. ate. You're Along with target go pick a, push, yeah. a puff ball down from the stream and slice it up and grill it, you know? Like, anyway. So we're sitting at the table because it's all day. My sister's been just bawling, bawling. And uh, they're sitting down, and each of them are eating breakfast, lunch, and dinner. <laughs> breakfast and my, is And my youngest sister, she looks at me, she's like, dinner tastes so good. <laughs> and she still has the streaks through the dirt running through her face from the earlier in the day because they've been all there all day. <gasps> That's a pretty uh, 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 dark story. <laughs> anyway. That's a dark Thanksgiving, dude. So I'll just sum up the rest of my uh, younger uh, ages So in uh, two minutes. So I, uh, I went off to college. By the way, I was valedic- amazing. I, I was valedictorian. I was a state uh, level athlete of high school. Yeah, and you're performing athletically and academically yes. like that from living in a trailer at this point, at least, but coming from the wilderness. Yes. And good for you. And so I got a full ride uh, academic scholarship to go to school. Pursu- Damn, pursu- you got an academic scholarship. Uh, yeah, uh, pursued a double uh, uh, double engineering degree. Couldn't go back home. I didn't talk to home. Uh, I didn't call home for a couple, you know, about a year and a half. Because I got to ask you, anytime I call, they'd ask for money. First time you got I mean, your own did apartment you get, or something. Yeah, of course they asked for money right <laughs> I, away. I, seriously, of I was course. going to school and I'd give them money because I was working full time too. So I got a job. I was working thirty to forty hours a week uh, in high school. school. In uh, I was working oh, in, in high school. I was working in high school too. You were. Yeah. Uh, evenings and weekends, and then uh, in college, I worked full time. Uh, while doing the the dual engineering degree, bought and my first house when I was twenty one years old. Twenty one. Yeah. What was it like to fucking buy a house? Going from what it, you come from, what is that's what I want to ask. What is that like? It was it was pretty cool, and I needed to because I was raising my sisters. So you took them. With I you. took custody Good of my three man. sisters. Right. You took so, full custody. Yeah. Oh wow. Okay. I took. Full and how cust- old were they when you br- took them in? I didn't take them all at once. So they were. I think uh, Melissa was thirteen when Pat kicked her out in the snow. Um, because, uh, that, bro. uh, what's well, his daughter, right? That's his daughter. But, he, uh, he thought she, he, she stole his favorite cereal bowl. <laughs> I, he, they're going a little crazy by this point, by the way, he's yeah. going a little crazy. Mom had <laughs> left, mom had left him. She'd had a mental breakdown and she was out in Montana. And so he had the girls and he was not capable and was on a decline. And so, yeah, he kicked out, uh, the youngest was living with a friend and the second was actually in juvie. And the oldest, who was 13 at the time, was living with him. And he kicked her out in the snow because his, she, yeah, he found it later on top of the refrigerator. But anyway. <laughs> Sorry about uh, that. <laughs> so I took her first. It was right I, next to the Lucky Charms, man. I then, didn't think to look there. <laughs> <laughs> and then, <laughs> and, <laughs> I know. There's so much to that, but they're pretty fucking funny. Like, I, me and my sisters get around. We laugh about this shit all the time. That's all you There's can so do. many little what ones you that you can't. That are just fucking crazy. Like, you're just like, what the fuck is this? So, uh, <clears throat> so uh, I take custody of her. I take custody of Janice, the middle one, when she gets out of juvie. And then uh, when Pat died, um, there was a farce that she was saying my youngest was living with Pat. And so I had to take cu- – uh, that's when I got custody of her because she was – she had a good kind of – a uh, friend's parent she was living with, and but she was going to get taken by the state. So uh, I got her at that time. So I ended up raising all of them f- through their teenage years from 14-ish uh, through 19 or however long it was to do where they and were out. job was affording you the financial freedom to do that for the four of you? Well, I lived in Southern Oregon in this small – it was a cheap place. And so I only had uh, the the two at the time. So, um, so I had two – to there. And then, uh, yeah, it was, uh, I was working on advanced my career. Apparently I was, I was, for some reason, this, 
kid that didn't communicate well with people, was laughed at, whatever, growing up, wasn't socialized very well. I presented myself really authentically in the the world and like people connected and I didn't know why because I wasn't like this super extroverted, articulate person motivating or anything that I thought like leaders were. Um, but I was doing really well. And so uh, I picked up, I was in Southern Oregon in a small town. Portland's the big town in, uh, in, uh, in Oregon. So it's on the other side of the state. And my, the oldest sister by this time was uh, 18, 19. And I said, the house is yours. And I took the middle sister and I moved to uh, Portland and started working on my MBA and uh, took a new job uh, up there. And that's where I took custody of uh, the youngest uh, as well. Damn, good So it was all, you, all big steps. So right. um, so then, then I had led this whole executive career doing company turnarounds, running automotive and aerospace companies and fixing them, prepping them for sale, like all sorts of shit. from the goddamn yeah, tree I fort <laughs> to I, aerospace. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Oh, that's range, man. <laughs> it is that range. Is fucking range, range bro. Yes. And that's and that's and that's where like I don't I don't like to tell like my story. Yeah, there's some rough stuff, but it was just different. It's different than most people, and I learned a lot and uh, from it. But the thing that I have from value is I've had a huge scope of my life that most people haven't seen. Same time, I also lifted a lot of weights and did some other things in that world too. So, let yeah. me ask you this. Coming again from your upbringing, what's the one thing that you've done in your life with your money that you never would have thought you'd be doing? Mm. I'm working on my pilot's license right now. Are you really? Yeah. That's yeah. crazy. Yeah. So, but I don't know. I don't really live uh I really live a I got a the only brand new vehicle I bought was in 2005. I just like making stuff and doing stuff and creating. So like I'm not a big, my house is nowhere near like what I, I, I don't know. I, I can't say that. Well, it's it, obvious. It, it, I say it all the time. My, my trauma, your trauma, it wouldn't have felt any better, any different with this palatial mansion, with this like mental illness is mental illness. Mental illness doesn't give a fuck how much money you have. Mental illness doesn't yeah. give a shit if you're, you know, a billionaire. If you're sick, you're sick. It doesn't give a shit about class or race or anything. You know what is – okay, the one thing – it because, again, I don't have a lot – like, I don't have a mansion. I don't have a bunch of fancy cars. I don't have that. That's not my thing. That's also not and, success. And, and, that doesn't but, mean success. But what I do have is I've got three different companies. I've got – the the largest one has over 50 employees, and it's a globally recognized brand, and we're doing things in the world to help people live better quality of life, to get people out of pain. And it's crazy. I work in this circle. I work with people that are the largest known public figures, the biggest sports stars in the world, the best clinicians in the world, the best uh, – I, I have this, like, network of people that I work with. It is so – crazy diverse it blows my mind when i sit there and i look at who i who i sit there and text message and podcast like oh there's the best uh, physical therapist in the world and that's the best spine biomechanist in the world and uh, that's arguably the best uh, orthopedic surgeon and oh i just uh i just dropped an offer and hopefully uh, to uh, oh yeah that was dwayne johnson that just read my book and oh the starting line for the la lakers they have my equipment at the lakers at their trainer's home and at their personal home um i and, and 90 plus percent of all sports, you know, in professional sports in North America, 600 plus colleges, any big name that you can think of, uh, all the, the actors for the action movie stars and stuff like that, the sets they're training on, you know, they're using our equipment. Like, that's fucking cool. That's awesome. And the better dude. thing is, I get a message almost every day from someone around the globe saying, you changed my life. Gratitude, yeah. The, I was in pain. It was messing with my uh, my every aspect of my life. It was debilitating. I watched some of your videos, which are free, put it in place. I went to the gym. I just hit my old squat max for a triple, and I'm in zero pain. It's the clinician saying, I used your methods, and I've got this 65-year-old grandmother. <laughs> in 30 minutes, I got her out I of pain, learn and I had, her cry I had her crying because she knew that she was going to be able to pick up her grandchild that she couldn't pick up. Wow. It was... The person that says, 
I've read your book three times. I had to give it to my mom. It is the our go-to because of the impact it's had on us understanding how to live with stress and trauma and, and, and look forward in life and how much you can accomplish. So let That's me ask you. That's fucking cool. That's amazing. It's amazing and good for you. So what was it in your life that made you, because we talked before the show, like what makes you want to give back? Because we talk, some people never even deal with the trauma. Some people work on it forever. Like I'm sure the people in your family who have mental illness tried and maybe they found another way to relieve their stress. What made you want to turn around and go, hey, I, I want to help. Not only do I, did I want to help myself and my sisters, like which is, if that's all you ever did, <clears throat> excuse me, that's amazing. But what made you want to help every anyone out there, yeah. I should say? Well, my, my prior career, you know, I was doing company turnarounds. To me, my big thing that I just loved, that I cared about, that I really enjoyed in that was the impact I was having. Because you do that through changing people, through getting people to take on more that they think that they personally can, can accomplish and being able to accomplish it and then the impact that has. And that's how you create this cultural change it's on an individual level. And that was powerful. Coach, being a coach, being a mentor, and do, helping people understand that turning into challenge, turning into the things that scare you can lead to a better quality of life. At the same time, I owned a gym on the side and I was training to be uh, the strongest person in the world. And I was coaching people in the evenings uh, for free that showed up to our gym. Anybody, I'd mentor them in the same thing. Like I'd get more power out of somebody hitting a personal record or getting out of pain or doing something than I did by setting a world record. So I knew- you did set it? Oh, yeah. You yeah. did? Yeah. You were at one point the strongest man in the world? I set the all-time uh, record for the squat uh, on two occasions. I was ranked number one in the world for eight years straight. And then over the last six years, I trained for something very particular. Um, I am the only person still standing uh, who has both squatted 1,000 pounds and that. deadlifted 1,000 pounds That's and done it nuts. for reps. Nobody else reps. in the world is. I did it both for three reps. <laughs> So, you squatted a thousand pounds three times, and I deadlifted a thousand pounds for three times. So there's specialists. There's people that have done one or the other. Sure. There's about five or six people on either side that have done one or the other. No one's close to doing. This both. is what I read. I've that done, I've done both. You're the only human I'm on only, earth. And uh, I did a the deadlift was a sumo style. It's in the they only the, the records only count for one rep. But I just wanted to leave no doubt in the tank. That's why I did more. Um, it's still standing as the Guinness World Record. Wow, good so, for you, man. Anyway, but. I love the other part of it more. And I'm sitting there. My kids are getting a little older. I'm in my hot tub one morning. And kids are kids are waking up. And I'm thinking about them. You know how old they are? My son's about, well, that's how old was this? This is, uh, he's 12 now. Yeah, so he's about six years old. And uh, my second child, she was three years old. And uh, a four. And yeah, four, six and four. And I'm thinking about them and I'm thinking about them being in the situation I was. I do that shit too. And that's, I, I start crying. And I'm imagine like, looking at your six year old and being like, Jesus Christ, when I was six, I'm fucking getting taken by the police mm -hmm. and handling you got a and, nine and, month you know, old. I think for, and like, like, I didn't, it didn't strike me as trauma at exactly. the time. It was just, life and then it, when my kids started and that's when it was like it's like oh fuck that's when the emotions started coming back. thank you this that's is what when we, yes thank you people don't realize that sometimes you're living it you're just you're dealing with it you are it's, it's later when you look back on it, you're like oh my god me, i was the I, it was survivor mentality i was raising even when i was younger i was taking care you of my sisters and raising my kids i had to be there present even though i'm still dealing with guess what i've got the bipolar that runs in my family uh, my dad's side of the family i got major fucking issues there that's part of my life. Um, I had to make sure that that wasn't present. It didn't come to the forefront when I'm raising my sisters. I had to be there. There was nowhere else to fucking go. And so it just never hit. And then watching my kids as I'm morning in a hot tub and I'm like, I got to do something else. I got to do something more in the world. I happened at the time to also be um, 
uh, doing clinical continuing education. Uh, that's why I know a lot of the clinicians at the times I was just talking about because I at the time I was getting asked to speak at big events or at physical therapy or chiropractic colleges on the stuff that I was putting in place in my my own training, the gym, the stuff because I was, was kind of known for that stuff. Mm -hmm. Outside of my work environment, I was known as this phenomenal athlete and coach. And uh, I'm like, I knew that I could – I could help people beyond just the things that I was doing. And I could take that stuff that I was doing and take it to a whole nother level. And I had a great life. I had two homes. I was building a third. I had a massive retirement. I had a house with a white picket fence, two kids, a marriage that was entirely comfortable And I walked away from all of it. All of it. All of it. The marriage, the jobs. The house. I was living in an apartment. Had my kids half time. And I was launching Kabuki Strength. Lost my entire retirement. Spent three years without a paycheck, running up every credit card I could. Damn. Uh, negotiating the the situation with the, the ex-wife because um, – the kids was the highest priority. That was the Absolutely, thing that kept yes. me from doing that earlier. Um, and, uh, and so she's a great woman, and uh, we were able to to do that very well. We live five minutes apart. Kids are like it's it's as good as it good. can get. Uh, not a bad word's ever said in between uh, either. And uh, and yeah, that was that was just a few years ago, but I knew what I wanted to do in the world and where I wanted to go. And I had a driving passion to do it. A driving passion to not just be lost to the wind like Pat and my dad. Right. To leave my freaking mark. Well, you've definitely done that. And so in five years, I built a globally recognized brand. I found an amazing woman. I found what discovered what love is and passion and uh, in, in the home, have a third uh, child and the Three, my two oldest are just freaking phenomenal with the with the youngest. She's three years old now, and uh, launched two other companies as well. Wrote a best selling book. Working on my next book, which is actually focused on uh, on uh, kind of business and self improvement specifically. The first one's an autobiography, and because resilience, resilience of body, mind, and soul Fuck are like yeah. you have to have all three. And yeah, my work is on the physical side because that's I'm a professional. I know my shit. My team knows my, their shit. We're the best. We're the best at what we do. We make tools that change the game. Um, but the other two can't be forgotten. And that's why I do things like this. That's why I write my write my books. That's why I that's why I do this stuff because we have to have all aspects of this. Well, we were resilience. Talking. It's freaking. I I I use that in place of strength because people think, oh, you just. I, it's about squatting big weight. No, no. It's about developing resilience so that when the things come at you in life, you're ready for it. You're ready for whatever's going to buffet your way. That every opportunity, of the things, life's going to hit you and you can figure out how to, you can't change that. You can't change the trauma. You can't change the bad shit that's happened to you. And I don't want to negate it, but you can use part of that if you know how. To, to become forward, a stronger yes. Yes. version of yourself. Yes. Story I've been telling a lot lately is about trees in the biodome. Okay. Share it. I try to set up a special environment to separate it from the world to see how well it does, right? And they put uh, trees in there. They grow to a certain height. And then they just fall over. No roots at all. Doesn't matter what type of tree gets to a certain height, falls over. They finally figured out why. Has no wind. Well, has the wind hits up. it and it says, you got to be strong. You need to spread these roots That's thick crazy. and strong yeah. in the ground. You got to take your bark and make it robust to withstand the weather and do all this resilience. So if you don't do that, you grow and kill yourself. Fragile. You kill yourself, you're fragile. Yeah. And so you have to have Stress in your life. Too much? Yeah, it can be a dangerous thing. So it's a balance. But we do not live. The process of dying starts the, when we don't have anything to adapt to. 
trying to find that easy life, living in the mansion with no worries or on the beach in the Caribbean is death. If you don't have some stress and challenge, some things that scare you in life to be able to turn into and chase. I love it, dude. We we were talking before, and I, I said, you know, you see, especially out here, and this is men and women, putting all this money into their hair or their face or their lips or their bodies or their abs or their ass and won't spend a fucking dime working on who they are. It's all about what I look like, and they're the same fucking broken, fucked up people that they always will be because they'll never put the work in on themselves. So I, and they, but here's the thing: they've had the trauma, they've had it. Their thing is, if I it, look a certain it, way, I'll feel a different way, yeah. and that's the, the truth. Is you're you're you need to turn back to the time that made you feel that way, made you feel that you had to have those things, and talk to that person. That's right. You do be that friend to yeah. that person. Because I've been that person. For me, my job is amazing. People ask me what my job is. My job is to be me. Look, I'm sitting here. You know, I'm wearing my shorts. <laughs> I dress up. I might put on some sweatpants. My hair's a mess. <laughs> uh, you got that Lyle Alzado vibe. I, I don't freaking like, you know what? I'm bipolar. I'm ADHD. And I'm just kind of all over, like whatever. And this is the way I walk in the world. And that's okay. I got faults of plenty. A lot of them. And that's fine. That's just fine. Yes. That is just fine. So let me ask you this. I got this video. So Go ahead. people should check out. I got this video called Unkempt. It's on my Instagram. Check it out. It's it's really, really great. But it's basically talking about because people have been harassing me for like a year about my hair. And I'm just like, this is me. I'm unkempt. I'm also on a lot of things. Check it out. It's a really good poem. <laughs> on a lot so. of things. <laughs> all right. I ask all my first guests. Um, after everything we've talked about now, what advice you would give to your 16-year-old self? And I'm curious what uh, you would go back and tell 16-year-old Chris. Oh, man. <laughs> I mean, at 16, you've already lived three fucking lifetimes. Uh, yeah, I was... I was... Uh, I was definitely an adult at that point in time. And that's... Part of the problem, I didn't have an opportunity to really sit back and figure out who I was for a long time. And this is a major struggle for me. I had different masks that I had to put on. Kabuki, I mean, my company, because my nickname for a long time was Kabuki. I had to put on a mask. People would see me at work, and I'd be a completely different person than someone else that you might see somewhere else. Because I thought I had to be that way. And sure, I performed well, but that's that's what I do. I'm a performer. I'll get shit done. And it took a toll on me. It nearly killed me. Trying to be that and learning to walk that way. So it's introspection and the ability to turn into yourself. And the ability to really find what your North Star is. Your the way that you want to live, the really the truly underlying values, not what society tells that you want to be or anything that you can actually ever really have, but they're things that you can move closer to. For me, just to give some depth to this, this is stuff like sense of family or community. It is continual learning. It is challenge and accomplishment. It is having a creative outlet. Those are four big ones. The creativity piece was one that I was really missing in my prior career. But you should end up with like five or seven of these freaking nugget pieces that define who you are. And people, and this is what I did. I tried to chase. I need, I need degrees. I need a career that the money, this, and like all these things that you try to figure out how to build a solid life. But when you switch gears like I did at almost 40 years old, in five years, I was able to create an amazing life yeah. that every aspect of what I want to do and the ability to spend four to five more hours a day with my family by cleaning the shit and the fluff out of it because I knew exactly what and how I wanted to, to live and how I could pull the people into my life that I wanted that, that, that had the same shared stuff. It's transformative. 
what I've accomplished in the, I, I was successful as shit in my former career, but compared to what I am now and wh what I'm able to do based on who I want to be, it's a completely different game. And it's through that process of, of that inward turn to find those nuggets, to dig deeper, to peel back those layers. And that's what I drive people to do. And this is the process I kind of cover and my or drive people to in my book. Cause I can't tell you what, what you want. You want the mansion and the fancy cars. That's fine. Yeah. No, no, go but get why? It. why, why, why do you want those? Why? If it's a sense of, you know, if it's because I, I know I want to take care of and have a uh, uh, security for my family. And if I've got those things and I set that as my, you don't know why, but that could be the underlying thing. But if you don't know that, you could over leverage yourself getting those things and get the exact opposite of what you want in life. You could think, man, say that again. That is, over leverage yourself and get the exact opposite. Exact of what, opposite yeah, because you so set well you said. set your goals on the wrong thing. That's you right. set it on the For the, the wrong reason that you didn't understand the why. Right, the why. I want to be an NFL player, why? and then one random Saturday, your knee gets taken out, and now your life dream shot. Why did you want to be an NFL player? There's probably a couple dozen other ways that you can realize the same things that you want in life if you understand why. And this isn't a Sunday afternoon project to try to figure out. This is an ongoing thing. There'll always be some revision. But once you've got that, then you can move past the setting, the, the goals, the bucket list, all the other stuff that people go, I need to check the list and figure out what degree and what college I'm going to go to and what career I'm going to get and how much salary I need to have and when do I get married and when it, and I need to visit here and I need to have this. I hate fucking bucket lists. That's so you have to know your North Star so you can properly figure out the ways that you can realize that. That's great, dude. Please plug whatever you'd like again. Oh, I'm, I, if people find value in stuff, read my book. ChristopherDuffin.com. Christopher Duff, Chris, yeah, ChristopherDuffin.com or ChrisDuffin.com. There's a free audio download, or if you've got an audible, you know, whatever, uh, links to it uh, as well, or you can just find it on Amazon. Signed copies are on Kabuki Strength if anybody wants it. Like I said, body, mind, and soul. So I'm a big believer. You have to believe you have to have the physical component. That's why I make the products the education, and have the coaching uh, services that we do at Kabuki Strength. We work with the best of the best. That's awesome, it's, man. And there's a reason for that because, um, yeah. And uh, shoes, foot mechanics is uh, number one global priority in the body. Number two is, uh, or number one is, sorry, Foot mechanics number two. Number one is uh, ability to manage and control spinal biomechanics as well as back. Bre it's breathing. Back, no. right? Number one healthcare cost in America. Back. Is Back not, pain, yeah. not cancer, not diabetes, not, not heart disease. It's freaking crazy. And guess what? We all control it. And two of the big things is uh, breathing and how we manage this diaphragm to pelvic floor relationship. We can change that game so fast. Number second one beyond that is, is foot mechanics. And that's why I do shoe designs and uh, have a shoe company. So build fast yeah. formula. People are actually really into the performance side of things. You can take the next step up with that sort of stuff. But number one, you got to eat right. You got to train right. So that's the physical nature of stuff. But don't forget the other two. Thank you so much for coming on and sharing your story. This has been fantastic, man. I, and congratulations on all your success. I mean, man, I got to get my ass. He made me feel like shit today, bro. <laughs> <laughs> set my game up. Uh, as always, Ryan Sickler on all social media, ryansickler.com. We'll talk to you all next week.